So what I want to talk about today is actually the I got my notes here. What I wanted to talk about today is actually the disparity between um, ethical thinking and ethical creative choices because we can all admit that minimalism is like in right now, which is a total win and and, and I don't want to be negative about people jumping on a bandwagon or anything because that's how we get things done is people seeing someone do something and following after that. That's not a bad thing. But I think um, the problem is sometimes we get this kind of tunnel vision where we don't think about every aspect of it because we're so excited about this one thing and you know everyone's like on this zero waste. But um, I think it's really important to talk about fast fashion um, and specifically about how ethics don't translate across the board just because you're ethical in one area of your life. So veganism is catching on. Recycling is getting better. Um, people are DIYing things and, and being creative, but I think that fast fashion has a long way to go. And that's not our fault, you know? It's heavily marketed and when you constantly have someone pushing stuff in your face, you're not going to be perfect 100% of the time. And that's not the point. And you know what, I think a lot of it stems from the fact that we're in such a creative time right now. And um, let's take a bar of soap, for example. You know, you could buy your bar of soap locally, ethically made, DIY it, whatever, and you're not as connected to it. You're not as... Um, you don't value it in the same way that you would value your fashion because it's not a direct avenue of self-expression. You're not communicating things to other people with that soap. And that's what we get through t-shirts and things with logos, like things with our favorite TV shows on them or our favorite brands. But self-expression doesn't stop at clothes, you know, like it, it permeates so many different areas of our lives. Um, and our consumption because we are inherently egotistical creatures and that's not a bad thing It's not bad to say that we're overly analytical that we're creative that we're expressive But it just means that we're also hyper aware of what other people are seeing And there's a reason you know that that fast fashion has become such a huge thing in the past decade And, and that's a big part of it is technology Which has been amazing for so many reasons, but I think it's also brought a lot of um self-awareness to our creative decisions um, and you know like it's easier to be inspired it's easier to find community but it's also easier to feel like you have to look a certain way you have to wear a certain thing or you have to buy a certain thing you have all these people basically making you feel like you need these items to be happy even though in the end you know you may be less happy with the product because you don't value it the same way. You don't have the same connection to it. And I think it's it's really important if we're going to get past this to understand what exactly fast fashion even is. And the best way I could describe it is it is low cost and high production. So, you know, we're outsourcing labor, we're outsourcing materials to make as much as we can, as cheap as we can. And it's gotten to the point where, you know, 97.7% uh, of all clothes sold in the U.S. are made overseas. 97.7. And the whole point, you know, of making these things so cheap is that you'll be more likely to impulse buy them. I, I mean, like, if you see a t-shirt that you kind of like, and it's $5, you're probably going to go, might as well, right? Whereas if that t-shirt were, you know... $30, you would probably think through it more. And I think that fast fashion is so much about preying on our impulse to not think about things before we do them. And these items, they prey on trends that are not meant to last. Did you know that there are apparently 52 micro seasons in the fashion industry? 52. Not four. 52. So you're made to be feeling like you need to buy new clothes 52 times a year. And you know what, so many of these chains have been cited as making clothes that are meant to be worn less than 10 times. And a big problem with that is it's infringing on 
two out of three of the main pillars of sustainability. And that's what we're working towards. We've heard that word used so many times. And those two pillars are the social impact. And that is, you know, we have lower standards of employee care. They're high stress environments. Employees are abused and they're exposed to toxic chemicals in dyes and materials. Not to mention the environmental pillar, which is the whole point, really. Because 85% of all textiles in the US end up in the landfill. That amounts to 25 billion tons a year in one year. So not only do they leach things like methane and nitrogen gases as they biodegrade, most of them don't even biodegrade at all because so many are made out of synthetic materials. And that's another big problem, is that fast fashion is in the top four of the biggest ocean polluters due to microplastics. And it's not stopping, and that's an issue. Textile use has increased 40% in the last decade and is only predicted to keep getting worse. And it is so easy to be trapped with because you always have someone telling you that you need this, you need this, they're telling you what to wear, they're telling you what to like, and they're telling you what to look like. So really, I think the whole point here is learning how to stop participating in behaviors that lead you to feeling like you have to buy all these things and, and really thinking about what impact your consumption has on the world. And to do that, you have to start small. You know, you can't just throw out your whole wardrobe and, and stop buying things and, and start yelling at everyone about how they have to save the planet. I mean, I'd like to do that, but it's not how it's going to work. So, and you know what the problem too is that the system is designed in a way that it makes it really difficult to buy ethical, sustainable things because most people can't afford that, to be quite honest. And if you have to choose between an ethical pair of underwear or food, you know, you're obviously going to pick food. And that's also to say that, that just because something was bought from a fast fashion retailer doesn't make it inherently bad. So it would actually make it worse if you were to just go throw it out because then that's pointless. You know, you've bought the item and you're not going to use it just because someone told you that it's bad. And you know what? It was purchased from a place of unawareness and it's already been done. So there's nothing you can do about it. And I think that we also have to get rid of the idea that clothes themselves have inherent good or badness. You know, we want to value things for their whole journey, and that means appreciating the experience and the transition from, you know, the raw material to the actual manufactured good. And I think that we're so concerned about what the item is doing for us and, and how it looks and what others think about it that we have completely lost our ability to value that or even our ability to value, you know, durability and survivability. And I think that in talking about how fast fashion is bad, it, it it's kind of a double whammy in that it you know it also helps us talk about our self expression in general and, and, and how that system is flawed. So I think the whole point is really just, you know, wear what you want instead of what other people are telling you to wear or what you think that other people would like. And you know, a really good way to create a starting point is to really evaluate your own habits. And a great starting point with that is with the sustainability attitude stage scale. And this was designed from other research done by some really cool market researchers. Um, and I'll link them down below. But essentially it goes stage zero. And that's incorporative, which means there's no awareness, there's no ability to become aware. You basically don't care. And then you can move on to number two, which is impulsive, which you're kind of in the same spot, but you definitely have the capacity for knowledge you have. You're not so blocked in your mind that, that you can't fathom a change in attitude. And then two uh, is imperial, which kind of means that, you know, you're starting, um, you need really concrete ideas, you need other people to help you and to kind of tell you what direction to go in. And you're more focused on the immediate impacts, the impacts on yourself, and you're also still kind of under the assumption that you don't have any self-control. So that really takes, you know, the self, um, the responsibility out of it, and, and that it's, it's an external factor, that it has nothing to do with you. And then we move on to stage three, which is interpersonal, and that's kind of another step up in that you still have this idea that maybe you, you 
don't have the capacity for self-control, but you're starting to form abstract environmental concepts and you're starting to work this into your own framework of moral values. And you have this desire to be a good person that's not entirely based on wanting other people to see you do good things. And then four, which would be the highest stage, is institutional. And that is where you have a very clear set of beliefs and that you know what you believe and you know how to act in alignment with your own beliefs. And that includes a lot of really critical examination and analysis of your own self and, and your own reasoning for things. Along with not just trusting what the government and what institutions are telling you to do. And you know what? This is 100% fluid. It's not fixed. Just because you are at one stage doesn't mean you can't waver back and forth. And you know what? You shouldn't feel bad if you place yourself at like a one even. Because you know what? We all start from somewhere. And it's not meant to shame you. It's not even meant for to be shared with anyone else. It's really just for your own evaluation and to kind of pinpoint where your relationship with sustainability stands. And on that note, you know, with evaluating our relationships with sustainability, we have to evaluate our relationships with fashion and realize that so much of this is not necessary. Like, we really have to shift from buying things because we want them, we want them, we want them, to buying things when we need them and buying things that are valuable and are gonna last long and that are good quality. And this is not to say that you have to be perfect always. Like. I am far from perfect, no one in the world is perfect, like, I'm just here to tell you some facts. But, pretty much, sustainability is, is really complicated because it depends on a whole bunch of different things, like accessibility, and accessibility really depends on your own personal circumstances, your own abilities. You shouldn't feel bad if you have to place sustainability a little bit lower on your scale of needs, if that's what you have to do. Consumption is, is not designed to be an easy system. It's designed to make us feel like we need to buy all these cheap things, and it's designed to make sustainable options really inaccessible because they're harder to make lots of money on. And I think really the whole point is just being a little bit better than we were yesterday, you know what I mean? Like, And even if that's just becoming aware, you don't have to do anything. You just have to evaluate yourself and really think about these kind of things and that is a good step in itself and that's what brings us to no new 2019 so I wanted to create a challenge that was going to be um, a lot more accessible for people because obviously I can't ask you to commit to buying nothing new for all of 2019 if that's not your thing if you're not already accustomed to a zero waste lifestyle I'll make another video on why that's a problem. Um, you're not going to want to participate in this. So I wanted to make this really accessible for a lot of different people. And basically, the whole format is, for 2019, all you have to do is take a look at your consumption habits regarding fast fashion. Think about whether there's a specific area of it that you are really susceptible to. So like, are you really into buying new shoes or new scarves or new t-shirts or something like that? Take a look at your closet, evaluate what you have, and commit to a certain period of time in 2019, be it one month, be it one season, or if you're hardcore, you can pick the whole year. But just commit for that one little period of time to not buying those items new at all. And that's not to say that you can't thrift them, that you can't get them secondhand, that you can't make them, or that you can't borrow them but we are committing to not buying from fast fashion stores. And then your optional, I guess, third step would be to, during this period of time that you've chosen, take an inventory of, say you pick t-shirts, like try on and write down every single t-shirt that you own and keep track of how many times you actually wear that piece during that time. And then your next option, um, is, you know, if you say you pick the whole year, think about the amount of money that you would have spent on buying all those things at fast fashion stores. Maybe it's only, you know, 10 bucks a t-shirt, but let's say you buy 10 t-shirts in a year. That's $100. So let's say you don't buy any new t-shirts. You could put that money towards buying some ethically made, sustainably made t-shirts that are going to last you so much longer and that you're going to value so much more. 
So that's it for today, guys. Um, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. And if you're interested in watching more videos about sustainability or coming with me on this journey for 2019, subscribe below. And I'll see you next time.